Tonight at 11, the future of CHOP hangs in the balance. It all depends on uh, who agrees with who um, and, you know, how they uh, talk to each other to get things done. The message from protesters before they possibly move out of their occupied area on Capitol Hill. Plus, the focus now on another one of Seattle's precincts after this damage. The call from the police guild for it to stop. And Washington hits pause on reopening plans. The reason the governor is putting a hold on phase four. We begin tonight in downtown Seattle, where crews worked on repairs after violent demonstrations at SPD's West Precinct downtown. Officers tell us that the building has been targeted repeatedly over the past week, and damage last night has now led to an arrest. Our Ryan Sims is live from the West Precinct tonight, and Ryan, it looks like a protest has been happening there in just the past few hours. Yeah, they have been here uh, for more than an hour now, and uh, it continues. Take a look. I would say that there's probably about 50 people out front. We need to mention that this has been peaceful here tonight, so that is important to know. Uh, but that compares to last night where there was a lot of damage here, and tonight we did look into SPD numbers and discovered that this is very much an essential facility for them. When we need to hold the line, how are we going to hold the line when people are determined to breach the line and gain access into this facility? How are we going to do it? The head of Seattle's Police Officers Guild posed that question about the West Precinct a week ago. Yet days later, the situation hasn't changed much. According to SPD, vandals targeted this building five days in a row since then. The most recent case happened Friday night when a violent protest showed up here, literally at the building's front entrance. But when you deface police property, you, you deface public facilities, that's unreasonable activism. And it doesn't get our community where we need to be. Other than being a place where patrol officers are based, the West Precinct also houses 911 communications for Seattle. Given the incidents that have happened here in the last week, Cairo 7 News investigated the precinct's importance to SPD. We discovered the facility handled more than 126,000 calls of service last year, which accounted for more than a quarter of all police calls within the city of Seattle. Should the damage here continue, the head of the police guild worried that there'd be a definite impact to emergency response throughout the city. The only thing that's left if we don't have those capabilities is our physical bodies. Despite the precinct's overall importance to SPD, numbers from the department show the West Precinct had the fewest calls of service last year than at any other point since 2014. And live once again here from the West Precinct about the damage last night. One person was arrested. Uh, she is now in the King County Jail accused of property damage. We are at the West Precinct tonight. Ryan Sims, Cairo 7 News. Thank you so much, Ryan. Looks like that protest is peaceful at this point. Let's get to some new video at 11. Protesters were out again tonight on I-5, and this is a look at the group of a few dozen people who gathered near Pine Street. The Washington State Patrol says it will not try to stop protesters who have been demonstrating nightly on I-5. Instead, WSP says it will continue to temporarily close the interstate so that drivers and demonstrators can remain safe. Tonight, the future of Seattle's protest zone remains in question. Leaders of CHOP still say that they have agreed to dismantle that area by the end of tomorrow. But right now, many are still skeptical that it'll happen. When we were there earlier today, there were still dozens of people walking around in the protest zone. The people we talked to had varying opinions about what's next for the area. I mean, there are people that are here that are saying they're not moving. They're not willing to have the barricades moved. There's other people within the CHOP that um, are trying to work with the city officials to get the barricades moved. So it all depends on uh, who agrees with who um, and, you know, how they uh, talk to each other to get things done. Another big question is when police will move back into the East Precinct building. Everyone from police to the mayor's office to the protesters say they do not know when that will happen. Hundreds of pe people marched through South Seattle today with a message. The lives of black women matter too. They said this event was necessary in their fight for equal rights. As Cairo 7's Deborah Horn found out, they gathered to honor the lives of black women who died at the hands of police or in police custody. The marchers came here to the South Precinct, but they didn't go there. They actually crossed the street and came over to this park on this day, they say, was set aside to honor the lives of women who are black. When I say Nina, you say pop. It was Nina, a march like few others, pop, one devoted to the plight of black women. 
The Say Her Name Protect Black Women March and Rally made its way through South Seattle under threatening skies. Heading toward the South Precinct, it stopped instead at a nearby park, led by this pastor with the Washington State Poor People's Campaign. Her focus, the lives of black women who have died at the hands of police. To this day, we are still calling for justice for Charlena Lyles. We're still calling for justice for Breonna Taylor. Sandra Bland has not received justice. Reverend Bianca Davis Lovelace says it fell to women like she to highlight their message, even in the social justice movement. The social justice movement, movement has always been the good old boys club, but the ones who are doing the labor, the everyday labor, are black women, especially black queer women. And so we're saying at the end of the day that our stories matter, our issues matter, and we deserve to have our messages amplified. That was the theme of the rally that preceded the march. There was dancing and singing. Let it resound. A bit of poetry, too. But if you look in my eyes, you can see the reflection of me at 21, just trying to be me. A rally and march, they say, to ensure that at least on this day, the voices of black women are indeed heard. A group of counter protesters, Christians we often see at rallies like these, were here as well, appearing to try to disrupt the rally. But this group had its own security force, and so they were able to mostly keep them at bay. But everyone here says this is their first annual Protect Black Women March and Rallies. They say they will do it again next year. Reporting in Seattle, Deborah Horn, Cairo 7 News. And now to our coronavirus coverage and the latest numbers in our state. Right now, we are seeing an uptick in Washington. Cases are now at more than 31,000, and deaths are at more than 1,300. Testing is also up to more than 525,000. With that jump in cases, the state is putting a pause on some reopening. Today, Governor Inslee said the Department of Health has paused all counties from moving into Phase 4 of the Safe Start Plan. Phase Four would mean essentially no restrictions, which Inslee says is impossible right now. Here is a look at where the counties stand in their reopening. You can see them in phase one, two, and three. Eight counties were eligible to move on to phase four before this pause. In King County, COVID-19 cases rose by 60% this week. King County's health officer, Dr. Jeff Duchin, says taking precautions remains critical so COVID-19 doesn't come roaring back. He reported 156 additional new cases in the county over last week. Duchin said staying apart and staying home are still the best ways to prevent coronavirus transmission at a time when local cases are rising. There seems to be a misperception that because we're reopening, the risk of COVID-19 has receded. But the truth is that the virus is still widespread in the community. Duchin says the largest increase in new cases is among young adults, ages 20 to 39. Most do not need to go to the hospital, so there is still plenty of bed capacity. As King County cases rise, Mayor Jenny Durkin sent out this tweet today about testing in Seattle. It said Seattle's two city-run testing sites helped more than 1,600 residents get tested yesterday. She also asked for people to wear masks. This is the first full weekend since the statewide mask mandate went into effect. Issaquah is doing its part to prove that necessity is indeed the mother of all invention. Check it out. The city has opened a new so-called streetery. The rain put a bit of a damper on things today, but Front Street was close to traffic yesterday and today. and opened up to outdoor dining, all to ensure everyone is able to dine out while following social distancing. Front Street will become a streetery again next Friday and Saturday, and possibly even more weekends throughout the summer. Across the U.S., several states along with Washington are seeing a rise in cases. You can see here that 31 states have reported a jump in cases compared to two weeks ago. Delaware, Maine, and New Mexico are among the latest to scale back reopenings. This comes as the Trump administration ins insists that the curve is flattening. President Trump went to his Virginia Golf Club this weekend. Vice President Mike Pence defended the administration's pandemic response in a new interview with John Dickerson, set to air tomorrow on CBS's Face the Nation. I know there's a temptation to associate uh, the new cases in the Sun Belt with reopening, but it's important to remember that 
that states like Florida and like Texas actually began to open up in, in early May. The Trump campaign called off Pence's campaign events in Florida and Arizona this week out of an abundance of caution. Although White House officials say he will still travel to those states along with Texas. New details tonight about Boeing's rent and built 737 MAX jet. According to Reuters, certification, certification flight tests will start on Monday. It's expected to be the start of a three day test. Those flights will include a Boeing pilot, an FAA pilot, and test engineers from both. The jet will fly out of Boeing Field. The 737 MAX was grounded in March of 2019 following two deadly crashes. Crews plan to search again for a missing Seattle man on Mount Rainier. His climbing party reported yesterday that Matthew Bunker disappeared on Liberty Ridge on Mount Rainier, and he had been skiing down ahead of his partner. They believe he may have fallen in steep terrain. Helicopters went out twice to search yesterday, but poor flying conditions prevented them from getting close to the mountain. New at 11, a man is recovering after a plane crashed into the Skagit River. Look at this video here. This went down around 6 o'clock tonight near the I-5 bridge in Mount Vernon. Witnesses said the plane went nose first into the river. Officers were able to get the pilot out and onto the riverbank there. The 75-year-old was treated for minor injuries. Well, still to come in the news at 11, much of Pride Weekend is going virtual. But today, dozens took to the streets to share a renewed message. And today we saw mostly cloudy skies as well as rain. And more of that is moving in this evening. I'm pinpointing how many more showers we'll see through the weekend. Those deals, <laughs> those details coming up. The march unlike any we have seen in recent weeks. We were with the crowd. 60,000 people joined in on the march today. They walked in silence, but their message was loud and clear. We have found out that there's power in the community, that there's power when we come together. It can't be ignored, and we have to face this together. What change do you want to create? Crystal Marks, executive director for Seattle Pride, says the days of protests against police brutality and systemic racism made it clear the organization needed to pivot its message. The LGBTQ community as a whole, however, because so many um, in the community are white or white passing, have been able to advance our rights a lot quicker. 
and we have not done as good of a job as we should have of bringing along our black and brown community members. But you ain't beating me, and we are breaking free. The virtual event also includes musical performances by artists like electro soul and hip hop artist Carla Rons, who has called Seattle home for the last five years. I hope to be able to do two things, I think. One is, is, is express my own experience um, and be able to share that. And I think with my music, it's just such a, an easy way to transcend so many different barriers to where you can really reach kind of the hearts and minds of people. And even today, despite the advances made, a reminder that the struggle for social justice hasn't ended. It's going back to our roots. It's remembering that pride started as a riot and making sure that we're honoring that. Simney Kim, Cairo 7 News. And you can catch Carla Ronza's performance starting at 2 p.m. tomorrow. For a complete schedule of this weekend's virtual celebration, visit togetherforpride.org. And we are the official TV partner of Seattle Pride and proud of it. Join us tomorrow night at 1130 for the Cairo 7 Pride special, reliving some of the best moments from past Pride weekends. Well, it was a beautiful evening tonight, besides some great conditions and some rain earlier in the day. Check out this beautiful sunset photo, adding on top a double rainbow and all the boats. This was shared to my Cairo 7 Facebook page by Lauren, taken up in Squim. So thank you for sharing this. I absolutely love this photo. This is one you'd post on your wall. Now, temperatures today were definitely cooler. We were only in the mid-60s today versus the 80s yesterday. So definitely a big temperature change to start the weekend. 65 was the high for Tacoma as well as Olympia. We only got to 77 in Wenatchee and only into the low 60s for Forks and Hoquiam. The reason for that, we have a low pressure system slowly moving in from the north, so this trough is formed, bringing in this cooler air and moisture. It's going to stick around through tomorrow, bringing us more of this rain. Now, this evening, notice we're starting to see a little bit more rain here on the radar, picking up especially right around the Seattle Everett area, right along I 90. This is kind of that convergence zone where you have wind coming from both sides, and it just sets up perfectly, just kind of sitting put, and it will save that way through tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. Now, rainfall total, again, you can see where most of the rain has fallen over Seattle, Bremerton, a little bit up towards Everett, so not necessarily wet all around. We've definitely seen some misty and sprinkles across the area, but most of the rain, again, right along that line. Temperatures this evening, 54 for Tacoma as well as Bremerton, 54 in Everett, 60 eastern Washington, 53 out towards the coast. We'll cool a few more degrees tonight, but staying pretty mild overnight and into tomorrow. But compared to this time, even last night, I love showing this. It shows you the difference. About 5 to 15 degrees cooler compared to yesterday. We have the sunshine. But don't worry, we do warm up heading into next week. Now, speaking of the winds, here they are. It's a little breezy, especially right around the South Sound. Whidbey Island, we've got some winds up there. Around 5 to 15 miles per hour, calmer compared to what it was earlier, but still a bit breezy with this front pushing through. Through tonight, we do still see some scattered showers into tomorrow morning, into the afternoon time. More sun breaks, but also potential thunderstorms, especially right along the Cascade Crest, and they could go down into the Puget Sound area. Now, temperatures tomorrow will be a little warmer into the low 70s but warmer and drier for the rest of next week. Nice to see that sunshine. That is good weather for baseball, right? Chris Francis, you're here <laughs> now with sports, and it's coming back almost. Yeah, slowly but surely, we'll see some games in the maybe warmer weather, though it's going to look very different. We'll tell you what the Mariners will be going through as they navigate the start to their 60-game season. Let's hope it goes better than the negotiations went to get to this point. We're back in 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Cairo 7 is going virtual for Seattle Pride. We may not be able to be together, but we can still celebrate together. Go inside special online events and relive all the best Pride Parade moments. Watch Cairo 7 Proud Sunday at 11.30 p.m.
And we're back. There are reports. The very first baseball game to start the 2020 season will pit the defending World Series champion Washington Nationals against the New York Yankees. That's July 23rd. That's not a bad matchup. The Mariners will most likely play the following day against the team from the AL West, though that has not been confirmed. Today, players started reporting to T-Mobile Park to begin the testing and induction process to get everybody healthy. The M's will have a 40-man roster with another 20 players as part of a taxi squad for the season. They'll work out in small groups during spring training 2.0, as they're calling it, both using both the home and visitor locker rooms. You know, meetings could be outside in the stands. Weight rooms could be moved to the concourses of T-Mobile Park. And after all the workouts, they'll play 60 games. So you're saying there's a chance. And we are going to preserve your, your health and well-being above all other things. And, you know, and along the way, we're going to compete our butts off and try to win as many of these 60 games as we can win. Uh, it's, uh, and, and who knows what can happen in a, in a season like that when it's, to, when it's 60 games. You, Anybody can get hot and, and, and make a run, and, and I guess on, to that extent, we are, have as good a shot as anybody. But you know, we're, we're also highly focused on the big picture, and, and it will stay that way. Highly focused on the rebuild. Pitching's going to be a key. The Mariners have a slew of young arms. They can mix and match to get through 60 games in 66 days. Even with all the time off, a lot of DePoto's guys are ready to go walking in the door next week that that most or all of those guys have already built themselves into a similar place to where we would have been in spring training when they're having their first two inning outing and over the next three weeks the goal is to build them up to, to three four five innings uh, understanding that we will we will very likely adapt to the situation and we are going to run uh, a six-man pitching rotation Interesting. At this time next week, the Sounders will be getting will be in Orlando, getting ready to resume their season in a World Cup-like tournament. Now, yesterday at Starfire, the Sounders broke into a green side and a black side for a scrimmage as they geared up for the tournament after three months away from the game. And Coach Brian Schmetzer liked what he saw from the defending champs. The improvement was the time. So we were trying to push out 75 minutes. We pushed a little longer, pushed out all, all the way out to 80. So that was good for me. It was good. They deserved it. They wanted to play some more. I actually enjoyed that we were able to practice a few set pieces live during the game. So that was good. Uh, Gustav obviously has scored some goals for us. Nico's delivery was great. Christian's goal was good. The black team had some chances, though, so I wish there had been one more goal in there to, you know, keep it close, but it was good. O.L. Reign uh, will play the first of their four matches Tuesday night against Sky Blue FC. But before we get to that, we want to talk about the National Women's Soccer League's first game. Both teams taking a knee, a knee during the national anthem. Utah and Portland going at it. Portland scoring on a goal from Simone Charlie to tie things up in the second half. Uh, the, the defending champs came back with a header in stoppage time to win it. Two to one from the league's leading scorer, Lynn Williams. So they're off and running is North Carolina. And I mentioned O.L. Rain. They'll play the first of their four matches Tuesday night against Sky Blue FC. It's the first time we'll see them in action since they lost in the semifinals to North Carolina back in October. Megan Rapino is skipping the tournament, but the Reigns still have a good shot at a deep run with players like Ali Long and Lou Barnes. Let's talk golf. PGA Tour amid some more positive coronavirus testing continue their tournament in Connecticut. Two players shot 61s today, and they're both at the top of the leaderboard. That's Dustin Johnson within inches of the cup on number nine. He's at 16 under, trailing only Brendan Todd, who has at 18 under. You can see the final round right here on Cairo 7 tomorrow. And also tomorrow, the second of two NASCAR races in Pocono, Pennsylvania. And uh, this, yes, this is from today's race. A nice little tangle between Eric Jones and Tyler Reddick. Great view from inside Reddick's car. Everybody's okay in that wreck. Uh, a two-horse race at the end, a two-car race, if you will. Kevin Harvick held off Danny Hamlin on the final few laps to take his third checkered flag since the restart. It was the first win of his great career at Pocono after 38 previous chances. And he'll try to win two straight tomorrow in Pennsylvania. And we will have highlights. You know we will, Lindsay, because it's really the only thing going on in sports <laughs> right now. You're watching that in golf. Yeah. So. Yes, that's it so far. <laughs> All right, thanks, Chris. And yeah. we'll be right back after this. See live stories happening right now. Watch Cairo 7 at 11.
Good Samaritans continue to step up to the plate, literally, during these times of need. Volunteers with the Salvation Army set up a handful of collection sites throughout the region today, including here at this parking lot of a shoreline Safeway. And people did not disappoint as they donated food for families struggling during this pandemic. People who just aren't used to these kind of things at all are coming to food banks. So the, uh, there's actually been a 60% increase in need in Western Washington. Well, the Salvation Army plans to build a thousand food boxes with all the donations they collected today and then distribute them in a couple of weeks. And now let's check in for one more look at that weather, Claire. And I am keeping an eye on that Monday 78 degrees. Oh, yes. Already looking forward to the work week. But yeah, the weekends here lately, I just feel have been kind of wet and soggy. And that is the story again. Sunday, chance of thunderstorms into the afternoon. So watch for a little rumble here and there. Temperatures will be in the low 70s. We'll warm up Monday. Mostly sunny skies and upper 70s with a mix of sun and clouds by Tuesday and Wednesday. If you're planning to go up into the mountains, that's where you might see a few spring. Wrinkles, but mainly dry for the rest of the work week. And how about this Saturday, the 4th of July, or next Saturday, 76 and <laughs> mostly sunny. We can look ahead to they it right They say the now. summer doesn't start till the 4th of July, but ah, look, exactly. we got a whole week True. before. Yes. It's <laughs> Thanks for trusting Cairo 7 News. Good night and join us again tomorrow morning starting at 6. Cairo 7 News is live, local, in-depth, 24-7.